So you think it's not possible to travel faster than the speed of light? I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. But what I think, you know, if you look at the physics we understand, right? Yeah. Um, the, you know, every possibility for faster than light travel really relies on something that doesn't exist, right? So, so you know, the cool thing is Einstein's field equations, you can actually play with them. The equations are right there. You can add things to the, you know, right or left-hand side that allow you to get something like the Akubre drive. That was a metric that, uh, you know, showed you like, oh, it's a warped bubble. It's a warping of space-time that moves through space-time faster than the speed of light, right? Mm -hmm. Because nothing can move across space-time faster than the speed of light, but space-time itself can move faster than the speed of light. But here's the problem with all of those proposals is they all need something. The thing you added, the little fictional term you added on the into the equations is something called um, exotic matter, and it doesn't exist. It's really just something we dreamed up to make the equations do what we wanted them to do. So, you know, it's a nice fiction, but really right now, you know. You know, we live in this weird moment in history of the Great Acceleration, where like uh, the technology we use now is you know, is completely different from the technology we used 10 years ago, is remarkably different from the technology from 100 years ago. Um, but, you know, I remember playing um, uh, Assassin's Creed where everybody's like, you know, what is it? It's 1200 and everybody's like, stab, stab, stab. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's a great game. And then I got Assassin's Creed 2 and uh, it was 300 years later and everybody's like, stab, stab, stab. And it was like, 300 years and the technology hadn't changed. And that was actually true for most of human history, right? You used your great grandfather's tools because there was no need to have any other new tools and you probably did his job. Uh, so, you know, we can be fooled into thinking like, oh, you know, technology is going to go on forever. We're always going to find new advances as opposed to sometimes things just flatten out yeah. for a long time. So you have to be careful about that bias that we have living in this time of great acceleration. Yeah, but uh, also it is a great acceleration and we also are not good at predicting what that entails if it does keep accelerating. So for example, somebody like um, Eric Weinstein often talks about we underinvest in theoretical physics research. Basically like we're trying too hard for traditional chemical propulsion on rockets versus like trying to hack physics sort of warp drives and so yeah, on. Yeah. Because it's really hard to do space travel. And it seems like in the long arc of human history, if we survive, the way to really travel across long distances is going to be some new, totally new thing. Right, right. So it's not going to be an engineering problem. It's going to be a physics A problem. fundamental physics problem. Fundamental physics problem. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that in principle, but I think there's been, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ideas out there. People, you know, string theory, people have been playing with string theory now for 40 years. It's not like people haven't been, not like there hasn't been a lot of effort. And, you know, and again, I'm not going to predict, I, I think it's entirely possible that we have, you know, there's you know, incredible boundaries of physics that have yet to be uh, poked through, in which case then all bets are off, right? Once you get sort of, you know, interstellar, fast interstellar travel, whoa, you know, who knows what can happen. Um, but I, I, I tend to be drawn to like science fiction stories that take the speed of light seriously. Like what kind of civilization can you build where like it takes, you know, 50 years to get to where you're going mm -hmm. and a 50 years back. Like, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's no way I'm going to say that, that we won't get warp drives, but as of right now, there's, it's all fictional. It's, you know, it's barely even a coherent concept. Well, it's also a really exciting possibility of hacking this whole thing by extending human lifespan or extending our notion of uh, of time. And maybe as dark as to say, but the value of an individual human life versus the value of life from the perspective of generations. Yeah. So you can have something like a generational ship that travels for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah. And it you're not sad. Uh, that you'll never see the destination because you kind of have the value for yeah. the uh, prolonged yeah. survival of humanity yeah. versus your own individual life. Yeah. It's a wild ethical question, isn't it? One of the, that book I told you about, Aurora, it was such, I love the book because it was such a sort of inversion of the usual. Because, you know, I've read, I love science fiction. I've read so many generation ship stories. And they get to that planet. The planet turns out to be uninhabitable. It's inhabited, but it's uninhabitable for Earth. Because again, he has this idea of like, you know, life is particular to their planets. So they turn around and they come back. And then when they land, 
the main character goes, for, there's still people who are, you know, arguing for more generation ships. And she goes and she punches the guy out because she spent her whole life in a tube, yeah. you know, with this. I, th I thought that was a really interesting inversion. You know, the interesting thing about, about we were talking about these space habitats, yeah. but if you really had a space habit, not some super cramped, you know, crappy, the usual version of a century ship. But if you had these like space habitats that were really, you know, like the O'Neill cylinders, they're actually pretty nice places to live. Put a thruster on those, you know, like why, why keep them in the solar system? Maybe that's, maybe space is full of like these sort of traveling space habitats mm -hmm. that are in some sense a, you know, they're worlds in them in and of themselves. There's the show Silo, which raises the question of basically, if you're putting on a generational ship, uh, what do you tell the inhabitants of that ship? You might want to lie to them. Yeah. You might want to tell them a story. Right. That they believe. Right. Because there is a society, there's human nature, there's like, how do you maintain uh, homeostasis of that little society? Um, I mean, that, that's a fascinating technical yeah. question, the social question, the psychology question. You know, the generation ship too, you know, which I talked about in the book, the idea of the, also the, you know, you talked about extending human lifetimes or, um, you know, the stasis, the cryostasis, which is a mainstay yeah. of science fiction, you know, that, you know, right, you can be put to, you, know, you can basically put in suspended animation and such. None of these things we know are possible, but you know, it's so interesting. And this is why I love science fiction, the way it seeds ideas, right? All these ideas we're going to talk about because they've been staples of science fiction for 50 years.